It is Friday, April 30th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back to the show, everybody, and happy Returnal Day. The game is finally available, so if you do decide to pick it up and play it, I hope you have a great time with it. I personally cannot wait to be done with this video so I can play it myself, but um, we do have a lot of stories to cover, and as always, we'll start with our PlayStation Plus reminder. So, the April games are not going to be available for that much longer, so make sure you grab these. May 4th, it will change over, and those games are Stranded Deep, Battlefield 5, and Wreckfest is our PlayStation 5 benefit, which is pretty good considering that the PlayStation 5 upgrade was a $10 fee from the base game, which won't be available until, well, wasn't supposed to be available until June, but now you'll be able to claim it for free on PlayStation Plus. Uh, I've been meaning to try Stranded Deep, so that works out pretty well. A eh, decent month, I'd say. Although, like we've been seeing previously, once again, there is some crossover here with what was available on PlayStation Now, which I really wish they would stop doing because if you're subscribed to both of these services, then you're losing more incentive and more value to stay subscribed to both of them. And really, this harms PlayStation Now more than it does Plus because you need Plus for that online play. But anyway, moving on to our first news story, we recently got PS5 system software update 21.01.30.10 which was a small improvement to overall system performance. We've seen this a lot when we get major firmware updates that introduce new features. There's always a little one shortly after, like a week and a half, two weeks later, that usually fixes whatever was wrong with the previous one, which for this, there were probably a handful of things that they wanted to clean up, like the uh, DualSense battery indicator. I think that was an issue, but that should be uh, fixed up now. Now, speaking of updates, if you have an iPad or iPhone, then you can now use a DualSense on iOS 14.5, which saw a wide release. So before we knew this was part of the beta, and now this is officially available for everybody. So you can use a DualSense controller to play iOS games or even for remote play, which is probably uh, more applicable if you want to use that second screen streamed experience. Next up, you probably noticed on April 27th, this past Tuesday, PSM was down for about an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, which isn't terribly inconvenient considering it was back up within two hours or so globally, but it was very bad timing on Sony's part because this was dangerously close to the 10 year anniversary of the PSN outage from 2011, which I'm sure a lot of you remember at this point. And if you didn't, you've probably heard about it. So <laughs> that was a, you know, quite a low point for Sony. So the company definitely does not like when these situations happen. And this one outage was very close to the 10 year anniversary. Now it's been a while since we talked about this game, but it is still part of the PlayStation Studios lineup and they are trying to uh, do something with the title, which is Destruction All-Stars. So we just recently learned about season one, which will launch May 4th and run to the end of June. And a number of changes are coming to the game. So pretty noteworthy here because a lot of us probably redeemed it. So you have it on the back burner. It's always available to redownload if you want to jump back into it. So just very quickly, here's some of the changes coming with season one, which is called Hot Shots. Uh, there's a new all-star for one, Alba. This includes a new challenge series as well. And there's an all-star pass that's getting introduced. This is a new way to earn cosmetics. There's new skins, emotes, avatars, banners, and shouts. Uh, new seasonal challenges with ways to earn all-star coins and destruction points which, you know, you've got that premium currency in there, so you don't have to pay money if you don't want to. Uh, new photo mode coming for the single player campaign. There's a new game mode called Blitz, which is a four team, three player split deathmatch mode, which will force a character change every round. And each round will be on the shorter side and that will play out over and over until a team wins a set number of rounds for the total match victory. This will be unranked for the time being, but that's a new mode that's getting introduced. And then just as a little PSA, the only premium content in season one is the premium tier of the All-Star Pass and Albus Challenge series. But that's what we've got so far for season one. It's a lot of changes. I mean, that's the thing. This game did not land initially and there was not a whole lot there. So we know that they've got at least a minimum of one year in terms of a content roadmap. And because it was a PS Plus game, a lot of people have this title banked in their library, even if you've already deleted it right. So there is opportunity for them to turn it around and for you to hopefully try it again and see if it works out much better. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Moving on to our next news story, as I said at the top of the show, Returnal is now available and based on over 80 reviews, the game is sitting on an 86 at Metacritic, which is very good. So I'm just, I'm thrilled to see how well the game is being received so far initially. And it seems like there's actually a lot of content in there. So you can play this game easily for, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours, depends on how good you are at the game and how much you really want to invest into it but um, I'm just so thrilled because I love Housemarque stuff and this is their most ambitious title up to this point. And actually over on the official Housemarque blog, the co-founder said this and I quote here, 
In the age when game publishers are taking less and less creative risks, we are truly thankful to our publishing partner Sony, who has given us an opportunity to work on something very risky and has given us fantastic support during the whole project. We are forever grateful for having this opportunity. What's so noteworthy about this is not even necessarily how this contradicts what we've been seeing the past few months that Sony isn't taking risks or doing different kinds of software. We all know that's not true as of right now. Who knows two, three years from now, but we could also make the argument that it's only larger budget stuff, which that is inherently what Returnal is, but that's what's so interesting about this situation because for Housemark, they were in a rock and a hard place after shipping things like Resogun because they flat out said, look, Arcade's dead. We can't do this kind of game anymore because it just doesn't move the amount of units like it used to. Um, and that was concerning, but it is great to see that they were able to secure a budget to try something so much different from what they've been doing, but they still retained that bullet hell arcadey fast gameplay and transitioned it to a full 3D environment and this big budget roguelike, which is doing uh, a narrative tied directly to the gameplay. I just, I'm thrilled to see that that's where Housemark is right now. But anyway, moving on to our next news story, which was yesterday's State of Play. So we recently got a new State of Play, which showcased largely Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart gameplay. Uh, but also we had two minor updates on some software, which was Subnautica Below Zero coming to PS4 and PS5 May 14th. Um, we knew about this game already, but we got a new trailer, which it looks, you know, looks fun. Uh, also a free PS5 upgrade for the original Subnautica, which I really enjoyed. And then Among Us is announced for PS4 and PS5 coming later this year with an exclusive Ratchet & Clank skin. <laughs> that looks great. It's actually, I think it's adorable, but uh, that is also coming. So good to see that game is finally coming to PlayStation platforms. And then about 15, 16 minutes of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart gameplay. It looks absolutely phenomenal. Such a fun looking, gorgeous game, a true visual showcase for PS5 hardware, which we've been talking about this for a while up to this point with PS5 and prior to it coming out, it's gonna be a cross-gen period, right? It's gonna be a while till we see software that really uh, takes advantage of what these consoles can do with those SSDs as a minimum where developers really have a much larger memory budget versus what they've been stuck with for such a long time. And Ratchet, I think is a great example here. It looks great. Uh, we also learned actually that Mystery Lombax is named Rivet, which is also, <laughs> It's also adorable, um, and she's actually voiced by Jennifer Hale, too, so people might remember her from voicing the Mass Effect trilogy's female shepherd, so that's also, I think, very appropriate. But yeah, the game looks great. I can't wait, and I'm sure, um, I'm sure it's going to be a great game once it launches uh, June 11th. Now, getting into some of our cover stories, we finally got Sony's Q4 2020 financial report, which also tells us their entire 2020 financial report. Uh, and it's important to note here that for Sony, that runs from April to April. So you may recall that we talked about how they did in 2020, but that's the actual calendar year, whereas their fiscal report, again, runs from April to April. So we recently got their full fiscal year 2020 report. And well, starting off, unsurprisingly, PS5 still doing very well. Uh, 7.8 million consoles sold. Actually, during the previous three months, they sold 3.3 million. So they're now up to 7.8 million, confirming once again, the console is still the fastest selling console for the first fiscal year, beating PlayStation 4, which was the previous record holder at 7.6 million. And speaking of PS4, we can just jump right into that, which we have some lifetime figures updated here. 115.9 million PS4s. Year on year, that's going to be down again, and unsurprisingly, it's going to get worse from this point. But I think by the end of this fiscal year, we should see PS4 reach Game Boy levels, which was at around 118 million. So PS4 should reach that. Uh, but the more interesting metric for PlayStation 4 is that actually the console has now sold the most software of any console ever at 1.577 billion games. This beat the previous record holder, which was the PlayStation 2, at 1.537 billion. So this is an interesting metric because, well, PlayStation 4 is actually 35 million something consoles, probably a little bit more behind PlayStation 2 in terms of hardware sales, but nowadays a lot more people are playing and buying games and that is reflective of these numbers on playstation 4 where it moved more software overall than playstation 2. now as for playstation plus it went up 200,000 members from the last quarter so the total now is 47.6 million and year on year this is an increase of 6.1 million total and unsurprisingly we also did not get any updated ps now subscription numbers because well sony's probably embarrassed by that figure 
Now, on Wednesday, as part of an earnings call speaking directly with investors, Sony CFO Hiroki Totoki did also say this in regards to increasing their investment on first party. He says, and I quote here, we intend to increase development personnel and other in-house costs by approximately 20 billion yen or $184 million year on year as we further strengthen our in-house software. To enhance our software offering, we intend to continue investing and partnering with external studios in addition to aggressively investing in our in-house studios. Now that's on top of what they've already committed. So it's not just $184 million, which is a lot of money, but also not a lot of money because you spread that across all these different external studios that we don't know about in full, right? There are some projects that are completely secret, but we did learn about um, two new external projects with Haven Studios and uh, Firewalk Studios, but there's also the first party output. So 184 million, that's, you know, a single AAA game or spread across all these uh, studios. It's just some additional help on top of what already is a lot of commitment from Sony Corp. And in the same conference call, we did also get a very predictable answer in terms of PS5 production. So Sony CFO did say they're looking at various options in terms of either altering the hardware to skirt around the production issues or looking at additional suppliers. But um, Hiroki Totoki says, and I quote here, as I said earlier, we're aiming for more sales volume than the PS4 during year two, but can we drastically increase the supply? No, that's not likely. So this is what we've been seeing so far, which is there is more PS5 availability versus PS4. It just doesn't feel like it because there's much more demand. So the console sells out right away. In 2014, you could buy a PS4. I don't know if it was no problem, but I mean, it just, it wasn't like what we're seeing right now, right? But PS5 is still beating PlayStation 4 launch aligned. That is very much a fact at this point. Um, but they are very close either way. I mean, if Sony runs into serious manufacturing issues this year or later this year, rather, um, then actually PS4 would start to outpace it. But Currently, the company is forecasting that they'll still make more and sell more versus PlayStation 4 launch aligned. Now, some other things that we can quickly touch on is other interesting factoids in this financial report because, well, much like the previous quarter that we discussed, the company is still doing <laughs> really, really well with the PlayStation division. So here are some quick fire facts for you. A new industry record of $25.4 billion in revenue was earned for fiscal year 2020. Total profit was $3.23 billion, a new record for PlayStation. PSN reached a new record of $17.32 billion in revenue for fiscal year 2020. The digital ratio reached 65% versus 53% in fiscal year 2019, although the context of 2020 certainly helped that 65%. And for the next 12 months, they forecasted $27.62 billion in revenue and $3.10 billion in profit. That would be a slight decrease in profit, but they would be expecting another record in terms of overall revenue. So the forecasts here are really important because this tells us that PlayStation isn't expecting any sort of decline in software availability or PS5 availability. Uh, keep in mind when they sell PS5, they lose money on that hardware, but by the time that customer buys a PS5, they're buying games, signing up to PS Plus, buying PSN digital content, and that gets offset. It's all accounted for, right? Um, but this might tell us that for some of these games that we're expecting, you know, maybe Horizon, God of War uh, might get delayed or GT7, which we know is pushed to 2022, but technically when we're talking about the fiscal year, that could go into the first quarter of 2022 because it goes up to the end of March. So, you know, even though Sony is still expecting um, record revenue here, it could technically mean that these games will at minimum still possibly release before April 2022. Uh, just an indicator, not necessarily fact. I'll tell you though, in the midst of all this negative press surrounding PlayStation or this pressure that Jim Ryan isn't doing a good job, the company is reporting you know, good numbers every single quarter, every single year. It hasn't changed, it's only getting better. Now that could be different long term, but right now we just can't say that. And they are still investing more and more into what is Sony Group's moneymaker, which is PlayStation. So that's another thing to keep in mind. While Sony may not be as large as some other multi-billion dollar corporations, PlayStation is the breadwinner for the Sony Group. And that's why we're going to see more investment in PlayStation. Moving on to our next news story, if some of you can recall this, there was supposed to be a movie for The Last of Us, which 
didn't end up happening, and I almost completely forgot that was a thing, but that was years ago. And we recently found out why it fell apart. So over on the Script Apart podcast, Naughty Dogs Neil Druckmann and Haley Gross were on to talk about a number of things, and one of the topics was this movie. And essentially what happened was somebody in the movie sector that was involved with this project, they wanted more action, but Naughty Dog wanted it to be more slow and intimate, like an indie movie, more or less. And, uh, well, that's basically where they let the project go, and now we are where we are today with this The Last of Us HBO TV series, where they can approach it like they want to approach it, um, because they can do that. They can have more somber moments and not necessarily do what the game demanded, which was a lot of combat sequences. Uh, and that's the problem with anything going to a movie nowadays, uh, whether it's, whether the source material is like a comic book or a game or or a regular book, right? There's just so much there that has to be condensed to a you know two hour runtime. It just doesn't really work, um, especially when you have to push some set pieces for an action movie when sometimes it's not really, not really meant to be that. Um, so I think this was actually the appropriate call. Now, in terms of the actual game franchise, we did also get a very interesting quote out of Neil Druckmann regarding a potential part three, where he says, and I quote here, I don't know how much I want to reveal. Co-writer Haley Gross and I did write an outline for a story that we're not making, but I hope one day can see the light of day. That explores a little bit of what happens after this game. We'll see. That's in direct response to how part two ended, which if you've played part two to the end, you know there is room for more there. And that's the big question, because with Naughty Dog, considering the circumstances of how Part 2 uh, was building up and then eventually launching, a lot of people didn't like the direction of the story. Uh, maybe it's just anecdotal, but it seems like nowadays conversations are more positive surrounding the game, and it did do quite well. But, you know, games are a multi-year process, and this conversation that they're talking about, it's like if they're going to do a Part 3, it's going to be a, a heavy commitment, because when you start doing something like a part three or any game that you decide to do, you know that you're going to be committed to that project for, you know, four or five, maybe even six years. Who knows how long it would take? But I mean, that's what we looked at for the release of part two. It was quite a while until we saw part two actually launch on PlayStation 4. And for Naughty Dog, we know they're still doing factions alongside this part one remake as kind of these smaller projects while they're starting that early phase of what they want to kick around and explore in terms of just ideas, right? It'll be a while until we see that next big game. And personally, I would totally be down for part three, but also I'm fine with a new IP as well. When we are looking at a very long wait time, uh, you know, you kind of want Naughty Dog to explore something entirely different, even if you had a great time with part two like I did. So I am okay with either direction, to be honest. Now, for our next news story, as part of the ongoing legal battle between Apple and Epic, court documents recently revealed that uh, the revenue split for Fortnite is actually leading on PlayStation 4 by a very wide margin. So we got some data on the revenue split from March 2018 to July 2020 for Fortnite, and 46% is on PlayStation 4, whereas 27% is on Xbox, 7% is on iOS, which is pretty small. The remaining 18%, that's also PC, Android, and Nintendo Switch. I just found this noteworthy because... Well, this also might give us an indicator that, yeah, Sony wants to get very close with Epic on a number of fronts, and Fortnite is uh, potentially one of them. But also just this, uh, you know, this thing we've been seeing lately, which is uh, when it comes to streaming or remote, remote playing software, you know, we've seen Sony, now Microsoft, dabble in this. It's been an ongoing thing for quite a while. Obviously, we've had plenty of streaming services that have come, currently exist, and go. Uh, trying to push this idea that we can play these big budget games on multiple screens screens like you know iPhones iPads Android tablets and the like but uh, You know, this is a pretty eye-opening metric. I don't know if it's the perfect metric to really uh, prove the point here, but I've always felt that <laughs> It's not really a great experience ever streaming or remote, remote playing these games to these smaller screens I've never enjoyed it. I've always questioned who's actually playing games like that and now we can see the native Fortnite app on iOS is not really a huge driving force of revenue when we still see traditional consoles being the, the lead model, and if not traditional consoles, PC as well, right? Same space, which is that you really want to play those games locally on high-end hardware, and the last thing you want to do is kind of, you know, play on a smaller screen or... Um, or remote play those games to a smaller screen. That's, I don't know, that's kind of what I took away from that. Moving on to our next story, it looks like Sony has renewed the trademark for PlayStation Home, as in they didn't let it expire, so they did renew it in case they ever want to use it again. 
or they're just protecting their copyright, which is in all likelihood what this is. So I know a lot of people saw this and thought maybe there's a return or a revival, maybe something for PSVR 2, because we see something like VR Chat do very well. And don't get me wrong, it's actually a really cool idea, uh, but I don't think Sony would want to get involved in something quite like that, especially in terms of community curation. But uh, yeah, PlayStation Home, it was still a fascinating service in Sony's history. Occasionally, I still have a lot of people reach out telling me they want PS Home to come back. Um, there's a dedicated group out there that's actually restoring the offline functionality of PlayStation Home, and that's a really cool project, but largely PlayStation Home is still something that I don't think Sony will ever go back to, at least not anytime soon. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Support on this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was building the ultimate PlayStation 3. So I recently picked up a 60 gig off of eBay and I show you all the general maintenance, but also some modifications you can do to those early backwards compatible PS3s to make sure they're very reliable for long-term play. Uh, and I always encourage to pick up one of those things because they're just, they really are in my view, the ultimate PlayStation because they can play so much. Combine it with a PS5, you got really good coverage there. Um, so go check that video out. And then this coming Tuesday, as always, another video. Don't know what it is, but I'm sure I'll have something uploaded uh, for you all to watch. And that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.